Perhaps the most famous sequence in all of mathematics is the beautiful Fibonacci sequence. This sequence begins with two terms, one and one, and then each subsequent term is the sum of the previous two. So to get the third term, we add the previous two terms, one plus one gives us two. To get the next term, we add the previous two terms, 2 plus 1 is 3. To get the next term, we add the previous two terms, 2 plus 3 is 5, and so on. The origin of this beautiful sequence is often cited as being in the book Liber Abaki by the man himself, Fibonacci, who was an Italian mathematician who published this book in 1202, although in fact we can trace back the origins of the so-called Fibonacci sequence to well over a thousand years earlier. Indeed, historians and translations suggest that the Indian mathematician and poet Pingala had found this sequence as the solution to a certain problem. Now, in fact, Fibonacci himself published this sequence as a solution to a problem concerning immortal rabbits and their breeding patterns. Let's take a quick look at that origin for the sequence that we saw from Fibonacci, and then I'll show you the much earlier introduction of the sequence in solving a problem posed by Pingala concerning ancient Sanskrit poetry. So Fibonacci had this problem in his book concerning rabbits and their breeding. Now, the progression of this problem, whose answer is the Fibonacci sequence, goes month by month. So as I introduce the problem and the conditions, I'll just put a one here as we begin in month one. So the idea is we have this field and we, let's say, put one pair of rabbits, let's say baby rabbits, in the field. Now, to represent those two rabbits, I'll just use two little circles with rabbit ears. That's our beautiful pair of rabbits. Now, after a month goes by and we're in month two, let's say that the two rabbits mature. And so to represent that, let's use squares. So two squares with bunny ears. We'll use squares to represent those mature rabbits. You can imagine the soft edges of the circle maturing into the rigid corners of the square. So in month one, we had one pair of rabbits. In month two, they've grown up, but we still have one pair of rabbits. Then in month three, the idea is by the end of month two, now that the rabbits have matured, they've also mated, and by the end of month two, they're going to give birth to a new pair of baby rabbits. So that in month three, we're going to now have this new pair of baby rabbits, which again, we're going to represent with those two circles. And of course, we still have the original, now mature rabbits. Now here in month three, we have two pairs of rabbits. All right, now we suppose that this pattern continues. So every pair of baby rabbits is going to mature in a month and then begin giving birth to an additional pair of rabbits each subsequent month. So when we go into month four, what's gonna happen is the mature pair of rabbits that we already have is going to give birth to another pair of baby rabbits. So again, we've got those two circles. We then, of course, have that original pair of mature rabbits, and then the first generation children are now themselves going to grow into mature rabbits. And so now we have two pairs of mature rabbits and three pairs of rabbits in total. Fibonacci's question then was how many pairs of rabbits will there be in the nth month, assuming that these breeding patterns continue and, of course, that the rabbits are immortal. Well, perhaps you can already see that the answer to this question is found in the Fibonacci sequence. You can see one pair, one pair, one plus one is two pairs, two plus one is three pairs. So how many pairs of rabbits should be in the next month? Well, if we suppose that the solution is given by the Fibonacci sequence, it should be the sum of the previous two months. So three plus two is five pairs of rabbits in that next month. But how can we reason through why that would be the solution? Why would that explain this problem? Well, let's think about counting this. As we go into the fifth month, there's two things we have to count. We have to count the pairs of rabbits that we already had, and then we have to count the number of new rabbits. 
Now, the number of new rabbits can actually be counted as the number of pairs of rabbits that we had two months prior. Because two months prior, we had some number of mature rabbits, which are certainly going to be giving birth to a new pair as we go into month five. And we also had some number of pairs of not mature rabbits. But since that's two months ago, by the time we go into month five, any non-mature rabbits from two months ago will now be mature and will now be producing a pair of baby rabbits each month. So when I look at month three, which is two months before month five, I see I have one pair of mature rabbits, which will be giving birth to a new pair in month five, and I have one pair of baby rabbits, which will be mature and giving birth to a new pair in month five. Then the only other thing we have to count is the number of rabbit pairs that we already had, which we can just count as however many pairs we had the preceding month. So the number of rabbit pairs in the preceding month is the pairs we already had, and the number of rabbit pairs two months prior is actually counting the number of new pairs of baby rabbits that we're gonna have when we go into the next month. If we trace this out in detail, of course, this original mature pair of baby, excuse me, uh, of mature rabbits gives birth to a new pair of baby rabbits. We then have those mature rabbits still, and then we have these baby rabbits, which mature into a new pair of mature rabbits, and then we have these these mature rabbits, and we of course have their first generation of children. And so in total, we see how many rabbits do we have, or how many pairs? One, two, three, four, five. Those two, those two pairs of baby rabbits, new baby rabbits, and then those three pairs of rabbits that we already had from the preceding month. Expressed with some more math notation, we often write this to describe the Fibonacci sequence. Fn, the nth term of the Fibonacci sequence, is equal to Fn minus 1, the preceding term, plus Fn minus 2, the term that is uh, two terms prior. And of course, this acts as a recursive formula for this rabbit problem. How many pairs of rabbits do we have in month n? It's the number of pairs we had the previous month plus the number of pairs in the month prior to that. So that's how the Fibonacci sequence showed up in Lieber Abaki, Fibonacci's book. But now let's see how Pingala found this sequence with Sanskrit poetry. Now with Pingala, we're around two to 300 BC. Not much is known about him. The details Details are scant, but he was considering Sanskrit poetry, which consists of short syllables and long syllables. Now, we think of a short syllable as consisting of one beat, and long syllables in Sanskrit poetry take up twice as much, so they take up two beats. It's kind of like how Western poetry uh, can be counted in meters concerning um, accented syllables and non-accented syllables or stressed and unstressed syllables. Now, if we're composing poetry and a poem can consist of short syllables and long syllables, one might ask how many different arrangements of short and long syllables there are to construct a poem of a certain length knowing that short syllables take up one beat and long syllables take up two beats. So then let's consider this problem and start to hash out the details. If we imagine we're constructing a poem that consists of a single beat, so I'll put a one there, how many ways could we do that? Well, since long syllables take up two beats, you couldn't include any long syllables. If you're only allowing one beat, the only way to do that is with a single short syllable. So there's only one way to construct a one beat poem. Now, if we're constructing poems consisting of two beats, there are two ways we could do this. We could do this with a short syllable and a short syllable, or we could do it with a single long syllable. Now, what if we're constructing a poem consisting of three beats? Now, we definitely have some more options. We could have a short syllable followed by a short syllable followed by a short syllable. That would be three beats. Or we could have a long syllable followed by a short syllable. That would be two plus one or three beats. Or we could have a short syllable followed by a long syllable. Of course, that's just this, but in a different order. But we're talking about poetry here, so the different order definitely is important. This poem would have a different feel from this poem. 
If you're not convinced of that, just think about uh, the first line to William Shakespeare's Sonnet 18. It's written in what's called iambic pentameter. It goes, uh, shall I compare thee to a summer's day? It's got this um, this uh, unstressed and then stressed syllable rhythm. The dut, the dut, the dut, the dut, the dut. If you imagine flipping that in in each of those syllable pairs, um, it's it's not gonna work, right? If you were like, uh, instead of shall I compare thee to a blah, 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 you were like, shall I compare thee to? Uh, obviously the order matters, right? Okay, so you're convinced of that. Now, if we go up to a four beat long poem, now how many ways can we do this? Well, we could have four short syllables. One, two, three, four beats. We could have four short syllables. We could have a long, syllable and then two shorts we could have a short syllable and then a long syllable and then a short that would be one plus two plus one so four we could have two shorts and then a long or we could have two longs those are all the ways one two three four five five ways that we could construct a poem consisting of four beats now if we suppose that there is exactly one way to construct a poem of zero beats which is to just you know, not have a poem at all, then we start to see the Fibonacci sequence here, right? There's this one, I don't even know what to write here, but there's this one trivial poem that doesn't consist of anything. There's one poem of one beat. There's two poems of two beats. There's two plus one or three poems of three beats. And then three plus two or five poems of four beats. So we start to see the Fibonacci sequence at play here, and it's pretty easy to see why if you think about the construction, if you think about how we could count these. When I go to list off all of the poems consisting of five beats, there's a pretty straightforward way I can construct them. I could take any of the arrangements that consisted of four beats and stitch on a short syllable at the end, you know, this is four beats. So if I stitch on another short syllable, that'll be five beats. This is four beats. So if I stitch on a short syllable at the end, that'll be five beats and so on. So all of these, I could attach a short syllable to the end and get a five beat poem. But the other thing I could do is I could go two steps back to the number of poems that consist of three beats and I could add a long syllable to the end of all of these. Because remember, this is do do it's two beats prior. So I've got two beats of wiggle room here. So I could add a long syllable to the end of all of these. In total, that would give me all the ways I could construct a poem consisting of short syllables and long syllables that totals to five beats. I could take any four beat poem and attach a short syllable to the end, or I could take any three beat poem and attach a long syllable to the end. And so that's why we see the Fibonacci sequence at play here. And of course, if we were to list out all these options for five beat poem, we would have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight total possibilities. And unlike Fibonacci's unrealistic, immortal breeding rabbits situation, this context with counting the number of ways of constructing poems of certain lengths makes complete sense. There's no, uh, you know, there's no made up rules here like immortal rabbits or anything like that. But those are the earliest known origins of this sequence all the way back in two to 300 BC, around 1,500 years prior to the origins that are perhaps more popularly known with Fibonacci. Let me know what you think down in the comments. Pretty interesting. There's much that we could say about the Fibonacci sequence. Very fascinating piece of mathematics. And hey, be sure to subscribe for more of the swankiest math videos on the internet.